Throughout the course, we've tried to strike a balance between teaching to the test and teaching what we think are the most important elements of art history, which isn't always quite the same in our opinion. Forgive me, but today and really throughout our review time, it's going to be all about the test. When the test is over, you can get back to appreciating great art, which is really what this course is about. Meanwhile, here's a quick overview of the structure of the AP test. Half of your score will be determined by 80 multiple choice questions. The College Board is trying to move away from the purely factual recall questions toward more analytical, comparative questions, which means that reading and interpreting the questions has become more challenging. This is the fourth year that students will be tested on the new curriculum, but alas, I can only show you questions from the 2015 course description. We aren't allowed to release the practice test questions, and anyway, you're going to be taking that test in a few days. I'm guessing that the question strategy has evolved somewhat as the College Board has absorbed lessons learned from earlier tests. But let's take a look anyway at a few of the College Board sample questions, focusing in on how the questions are structured and strategies you should use for tackling them. Here is an example from the College Board course description. First, note that the question is vocabulary dense and wordy. At least some of the questions I've seen are too wordy. I think the College Board sometimes confuses complex reasoning with complicated sentences. But before you start drowning in the word deluge and panicking, realize you've encountered all of these terms. For this question, the most important term is formal qualities. That means the question is asking about the way the work is made and the stylistic techniques that the artist uses. It is not a question about content or meaning, about historical context, or about function or use. So, remind each other of what the following terms mean. I've underlined them in the prompt. Aerial perspective, saturated colors, flattened frontal figures, contoured figures, shallow space. Contoured means there is a defined boundary edge. Here are a few works that have a defined contour. Note that in the screen, some of the contour is a rather incongruous pale blue. The two works on top depict shallow space. We don't have much sense of background depth or perspective. Giotto, on the bottom left, shows the beginning of a movement toward deeper space. And by the way, Roman painting also captured deeper perspective. This is not merely a more modern phenomenon. The landscape by Velasco, on the bottom right, stretches way out into the horizon, into deep space. Artists employ aerial perspective by showing objects becoming fainter and bluer as they recede into the background. Note that the painting on the bottom is a Roman fresco from the House of the Vedi in Pompeii, and that the image on the upper left is a photograph. Saturated colors are vivid and intense. Unsaturated colors come closer to gray. So are the colors in the work on the right saturated? No, I wouldn't say so. The brightness comes from the gold, not from the paint colors. But why doesn't that matter anyway? The key to answering this question both quickly and accurately is just to remember that the Theodicos and Child is a Byzantine icon. It was created with encaustic on wood. You remember encaustic? It's pigment mixed with wax. But what's really important here is that once you have recognized that the work is Byzantine and an icon, then only choices A and B become possible. Aerial perspective is used for deep spaces, and we don't see deep spaces here. So A is an easy choice. But note that, <coughs> excuse me, the D is a very tempting choice if you do not remember that the work is an icon because the figures clearly are frontal and flattened. C is tempting because the work clearly uses a lot of gold leaf. So knowing that this is not a manuscript really speeds up the process and keeps you out of trouble. Very often you will be able to eliminate two answers quickly, but only if you possess a key piece of information, which is why it's good to keep reviewing the basic identifiers about your required works. And as you review each work, try to come up with some quick art history vocabulary that would describe it formally. How does the artist use line, volume, space, color, focal point? These will also help fix the images in your head for the essays. 
The College Board really wants you to think about the artist's intention, including especially the viewer's intended response. The key to answering this question correctly is to remember the function of icons. Iconoclasts claimed that Christians were actually worshiping these images, and that may sometimes have been true. But what the church taught was that these icons created a prayerful spirit and a connection with the holy figures, especially saints and the Virgin Mary. So A is the right choice. Remember, church and state were not separated in Byzantine Europe, and art was often intended to bolster imperial power. But the figures on the icon are the Virgin, St. Theodore, and St. George. There are no emperors surrounding the Virgin's throne. Okay, I actually complained about this question on the AP Art History Teacher Discussion Board, and other teachers echoed my complaint. The correct answer is late antique Egyptian funerary portraiture. I've added an example on the bottom right. These two were painted in encaustic on wood, and you'll notice a similarity in facial features and composition. I complain because there's no Egyptian funerary portraiture on the College Board list, and who has time to cover a whole lot of extra works? The best clue to the answer is probably the icon's location, the Monastery of St. Catherine in Mount Sinai, Egypt, a place I visited, by the way. Now, that's still a pretty obscure identifier. The figures also somewhat resemble Roman wall painting. There's an example from Pompeii on the bottom right. But these are fresco, not encaustic. Excuse me, on the bottom left. Note that one of the ways questions may be designed to trick you is to choosing one of the distractor answers that contain some true information but aren't the best answer to the specific question. This question is asking about technique. Anyway, there are going to be questions that make you mad and make me mad too. The good news is that everybody is in the same boat and you can miss a fair number of questions and still earn a passing score. So look for clues. In this case, Egypt was your best clue. Choose an answer and move on. Do not leave answers blank. You lose no points for wrong answers, so you should always guess. On to essays. So here's a short essay, again, from the College Board uh, samples in their curriculum description. The College Board underlined one keyword, both. What's a similar keyword that they did not underline? The other keyword is and. You need to talk about the design, function, and setting of the unknown work on the top and how these are similar to that of the Taj Mahal. So this is the point where you take a deep breath and maybe even say a brief prayer of thanksgiving, because the wording of the question in the photo give you most of what you need to answer the first part of the question. What function do they share? They're both tombs. Now, you have to remember that the Taj Mahal was a tomb, not a mosque. In fact, it was Shah Jahan's tomb for his favorite wife and later for himself. So, here's the scoring rubric. And as the wording of the question suggests, you get one point each for design, function, and setting. So, what could you say about design? Okay, this is terrifying. The scoring guidelines include terms you've long since forgotten and many I didn't even teach. But remember, this is just one point in a five-point, 15-minute essay. Your reader is not expecting a paragraph the length of the one you see on top. A few quick points will do. However, and I've given you this warning before and I will repeat it during review sessions, write as much as you can. One thing I do see in a lot of student essays is that you try to answer the question very briefly. Don't be brief. Write everything you can think of in the time allotted. any rate, what could you say here? Well, the bulbous dome is easy, right? The use of cut stone for decorative images is also obvious, even if you don't remember Pietra Dura, and I don't even remember if I taught it way back then. You do know what an Iwan is because you've encountered them in the Mosque of Isfahan as well. Throwing in that specific art history term would give weight to your response. Also, the walled garden and the waterway leading perpendicularly to the tomes are obvious similarities. You can see just from looking at the pictures. Remember, in a question like this, use the image. Be as specific as possible. Use as many art history terms as you can. Let me make a few other points, all of which you've heard before. Please, please, please answer the specific question. 
Don't just download everything you remember about the work, although again, write a lot, but answer the question and answer it in the order that it was given. Make a clear, separate paragraph to answer each question. Write in complete, clear sentences. I think it's better to write with an active voice. So that means saying the artist portrays violence rather than violence is portrayed in this work. Don't use the pronoun you and try not to use the pronoun I. This is a formal essay, not a social media post. Always, always, always back up your point with evidence. And if they ask for one example, give two or three. Remember, you are not penalized for wrong answers. Often, as I said, the evidence is right there in the image. So next, what could you say about the function of this work? So here's more information you've forgotten or never learned. Keep in mind, you again, you will not be expected to know details about a work that wasn't required. So don't panic that you know nothing about Humayun's wife. But you do know the work on the left was a tomb. The question says so if you stop to read it carefully and did not succumb to panic. That's when you talk about how both buildings functioned as tombs. And then add the information about Shah Jahan's favorite wife, which I'm betting you do remember. You might also recall that Mughal rulers used Islam to help bolster their right to rule, hence the resemblance to a throne. Rulers, by the way, almost always use religion to help bolster their right to rule, so that's usually a safe bet. Okay, how about setting? Again, you don't need all this information. Talk about the gardens, the fountains, the impressive approach to the tomb, and you'll almost certainly get the point. Remember to make specific references back to the image. Describe what you see. Don't misinterpret me. If you remember more specific information or precise art historical terms, include this in your essay. But I did not teach you about the Jahar Bag or fourfold garden, though now you know. We did talk about the role of gardens and fountains in this and other Islamic works, such as the Alhambra. And what was the significance of that in Islamic teaching? Actually, the question tells you, how do both works reflect the Islamic vision of paradise? Okay, some of these details appeared in the Islamic art and architecture video you watched a very long time ago. But you know that water, flowers, and gardens feature prominently in Islamic art, right? So it's pretty likely that these are elements of paradise. You also know that every mosque had a fountain for ritual cleansing. And by the way, the four rivers and eightfold paradise would be nice details to remember. But the real key to getting both points is to make sure you talk about both works. All the detail in the world on just one tomb will gain you only one point. So those of you who wrote the extra credit essay have seen this question before, and you still have time to write an extra credit essay on the Burgers of Calais. We gave you the work you needed to write about, but in fact, one of the most important choices you have to make with a long essay is which work to choose. The College Board lists these three. Any of these choices would be fine, and they have the huge advantage that you know the College Board considers them appropriate works for answering the question. Now, I used to recommend that you try to come up with a different example, make life more interesting for your grader. But since then, I have read a lot of commentary from fellow teachers and the College Board, and I've attended a couple of AP Art History Teacher Institutes. All of my sources gave the same advice. It is much safer, almost always a much better idea, to use one of the works that the College Board selects. If you choose a work that's from the wrong period or isn't suitable for answering the question, you get no points. It's too big a risk. Here is another long essay. By the way, one of the long essays will almost always be a historical context question, and one will have more to do with style and function. So, how do you think Bill Viola uses water conceptually to transmit meaning? Well, here are just a few comments based on the College Board's scoring guidelines for this question. Remember that there are two separate screens, but one soundtrack. So viewers perceive the sound differently depending on which scenario is being watched. The response might also note that in creating this work, Viola cited his childhood experience of almost drowning as the most beautiful and without fear. 
For viola, water, and presumably fire as well, acts as a barrier between this world and the next, suggesting a search for the meaning of existence. The crossing also uses water to connect the ordinary world with one that transcends everyday experience, a world that is perhaps spiritual. Think of the role that baptism play, water plays in baptism or water in Islamic paradise. The use of technology in the crossing may also allude to the disconnect between contemporary life and our primordial spiritual being. The crossing was often shown in churches. I actually saw it uh, in the Papal Palace in Avignon. With projected images, the viewer is spared the physical sensations of heat and moisture. Finally, the use of video technology enables the artist to show water moving over time. It's a very important feature of videos and is fairly obvious. So here are works that the College Board suggested as possible candidates for comparison. <clears throat> if you have time, and since we've just studied it, what similarities and differences do these works suggest in the conceptual use of water to transmit meaning? By the way, I think this is a hard question. You almost certainly have more to say than you realize, but 30 minutes is not much time to organize your thoughts and write an essay. We'll practice some brainstorming in further review sessions, but I really encourage you to do this on your own as well, perhaps with questions from a review book. Well, back at the beginning of the course, I promised we would not send you into the exam room in May unprepared for what you're going to encounter. But I also noted that just how prepared you are depended at least as much on your thought and effort as on what we've managed to teach. So, at this point, you have almost a week to review. That's not enough time to make up for a year of skipping homework or spacing out in class, but it is enough time to drag information you've buried deep in your mental hard drive onto your mental desktop, ready to draw on quickly an exam day. And way back in August, I also made this promise. By May, you will be amazed at the places you've been, at the art you've seen, and how much you now know. In the end, Ms. Jacobs and I care a whole lot more about starting you off on a lifelong love affair with art than we do about how you score on the AP test. So hang in there, work hard this last week, and then get on with the rest of what we hope is an art field life. As you go off to art museums, send me an email. I love to hear from my students.